Hello people, I've got Michael Latora here today and Michael's been in the transhuman conversation, uh, the movement since the 90s and has been, uh, yeah, he's got a master's degree, has worked for 16 years at Technical Writer uh, and for a variety of companies in California and Texas. He's served on the board of directors of Humanity Plus in the past, currently is part of the Institute for uh, Ethics and Emerging Technologies and also is um, part of the Zen Center for the for Las Cruces in uh, New Mexico. So, well, yeah, would you like to just discuss what this Zen Center does, um, and yeah, what you do there? Sure. Um, our Zen Center is a small place where people can come and learn and practice Zen meditation together, learn something about uh, the Buddhist teachings the Eightfold Way and how to um, treasure and use the, the three gems of Buddhism, the, the Buddha, who's the uh, archetypal teacher, the Dharma, the teaching uh, given by the Buddha and uh, also by his uh, greatest followers, and the Sangha, which is the community of practitioners. Uh, something of value there that sometimes gets overlooked is community being able to practice with a group which is different from sitting in a room by yourself not that sitting in a room by yourself and practicing meditation uh, w would be undesirable or not worthwhile it certainly is desirable and worthwhile but practicing with a group has a different dynamic and uh, opens up other possibilities mm. Now, um, yeah, I've interviewed James Hughes a number of times, and as some viewers may be aware, we've spoken about the relationship between uh, um, Buddhism and transhumanism. What what was it about uh, transhumanism that piqued your interest in the 90s, and how would you say that these ideas intersect? Transhumanism... Um for me, as for many people I've spoken to, uh, was a, an encounter that um, had a feeling of, of, of deja vu about it. When I began reading about the ideas of transhumanism, uh, I found that I was already a transhumanist. I already agreed with most of what I encountered. So it finally had a name. It wasn't just something um, science fictional or aspirational in regards to future technology and uh, scientific developments that we might hope for, but it was <clears throat> it was more coherent. Um, my first uh, encounter with transhumanism actually didn't occur online, surprisingly, but um, through uh, uh, a magazine. Um, I was in a bookstore in Albuquerque, the northern part of New Mexico, and I discovered the Extropy Institute uh, magazine that Max Moore and other folks have been putting out um, when he was at MIT. And uh, I was just struck by this because it was, uh, it was again resonating with me. It was like meeting um, someone that, you know, kind of love at first sight. Hmm. So, yeah, that was my encounter uh, first was through the magazine. And then later I discovered uh, transhumanism online, first through the uh, Extra B Institute uh, email list, uh, EXI, which is still going strong even though the Extra B Institute itself is no longer uh, active. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah, that was uh, my encounter with transhumanism. Well, um, in a lot of uh, Buddhists out there wouldn't see the connection um, between uh, Zen uh, or Buddhism in general and transhumanism. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, that you know, I guess a lot of people take from some of these like disciplines or philosophies that you you know you you have to revoke the physical world or or whatnot, and and may see transhumanism as um, trying to like embrace the physical world or you know uh, put their arms around the material world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I am by no means a typical Buddhist in my embrace of transhumanism. Uh, I have a lot of Buddhist friends who, who frankly think I must be nuts to uh, be so much in favor of, of science and technology rather than um, the 
approach to Buddhism that they prefer, which is more um, poetical or um, social activist without the technology being involved, and uh, in a sense more traditional. Um, I, I do not reject those approaches, but I think that um, it would be a mistake in terms of what transhumanist um, sort of technologies for um, enhanced lifespan, health span, um, capacities of the body and brain, and um, opportunities for spiritual practice that could come from the technologies of superabundance and uh, freedom that could eventuate from a, a th the kind of transhumanist, um, if not paradise, at least in not utopia, improved, vastly improved uh, living circumstance that we potentially could enjoy. Again, I don't believe in utopias or paradise uh, on earth in some material terms, but I think, with some poetic license here, that it would be fair to say that the kind of human flourishing and opportunities in a transhumanist, um, technologically enhanced world, compared to the world we're in now, would seem like a paradise if you could, you know, step through a door in time from this moment to some time in the future, whenever that might be, that all of these things have been um, successfully developed. It, it would seem so much better that even though the people there would start pointing out all its shortcomings, we would say, no, no, you should see how bad it was, you know, 50, 100, 300 years earlier. It's, it's relative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting, um, this her movie, you know, which was about an operating system that um, that was designed for lonely people to fall in love with and have companionship with, uh, uh, started going zen when he when they invoked um, a virtual Alan Watts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I love the movie Her. Um, I, I think Ray Kurzweil was uh, correct in in saying that. A uh, great movie, but technologically, if th they were able to do that, they certainly would have been able to create a, a visual uh, avatar um, of uh, Scarlett Johansson. And, and I have to say, even without that, uh, she did a terrific voice uh, performance in, in that movie. And, and I love Scarlett Johansson um, <laughs> visually as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, I don't disagree. There, there, there's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she is uh, I think mm -hmm. the the top rated um by some people mm -hmm. uh actress today mm -hmm. uh for many reasons. The um yeah, uh the the possibilities there of technology um advancing when there is something that is either true artificial intelligence or indistinguishable from it, even if technically it's not really, uh, you know, a sentient or a superhuman um, consciousness the way uh, the character of Samantha was portrayed in, in her. Even not being quite that level, but being close to it would, would be a, sufficient for a lot of lonely people who just want to be able to have an intelligent conversation with someone who is really kind and interesting and funny um, the the voice performance that Scarlett Johansson did what was remarkable because um, the character was both um, knowing and and yet also naive exploring growing um, really expressed a, a sympathetic joy at what um, the the main character played by Joaquin Phoenix what was uh, going through in his life, um, 
I don't I don't want to say too much more about that because I don't want to give away spoilers to the movie. Mm. My my opinion about that, by the way, is that the trailers for the film and the early write-ups mm. could not express how good the movie is without giving away too many spoilers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 true. Um, I'm wondering if my next question. Well, I've got a I've got a related but like a different question. I mean, like it did explore the possibilities of like um, AI uh, trying to explore state spaces that were not just purely number, like you know, based on solving mathematical theorems. Well, you know, at least on the surface, um, and it seems like uh, it was a an interesting. Yeah, it seems it was interesting that they used that to try and uh, develop a plot about like you know trying to develop a motivation for Samantha to 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 um, uh, I guess emerge so about exploring state spaces in terms of what we can do with the 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 use of technology today and in the future uh, it seems like a really interesting prospect what, what, what can we do I mean even just today to help us meditate and and help us focus and uh, help us um, achieve states of mind that are that are worthy of experiencing that we wouldn't normally at an office or you know in, in day-to-day life. Mm-hmm. Um, when I address your question, I'd, I'd like to continue uh, using the movie Her, yeah. um, <laughs> and per- particularly because you mentioned something that happens in the film in which a um, a, a virtual emulation of Alan Watts the um, author, a 20th century author who, who wrote a lot about um, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, explaining them to Westerners, particularly in the 1960s when there was interest in this, but very little knowledge and even fewer people who had had any experience practicing uh, the actual disciplines uh, of these uh, Eastern religions. Um, so, uh, at, at the risk of giving away spoilers in the movie... Uh, I think a lot of people who are watching this video would have actually seen it. But for anybody <laughs> okay. who doesn't, um, spoilers, spoiler alert, you know, put your fingers in your ears or fast forward another, you know, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. <laughs> so, the Alan Watts um, emulation is created by a, a group of... AIs, including Samantha, who have, uh, of course, read all his books, probably in about 15 seconds, and uh, watched his videos, and maybe if those were done in compressed time in another, you know, two minutes, and then um, enter into a, a conversation with him, asking questions and getting responses. Um, And now, to directly uh, address your question, I suspect that what Alan Watts would be telling them, and they, uh, these this collection of AIs, would begin exploring, is um, both something that you said, these state spaces, which you can also call different states of consciousness, mm-hmm. and uh, what the Buddha said most crucially about the nature of experience as experience, regardless of what state space you're in. Hmm. So, first, state spaces, what, what could they be? Um, we exist right now in, in uh, a complex uh, experiential state where we have uh, bodily sensations, so there is a there are tactile sensations. We have a, a sense of um, our body as being, you know, filled with energy or not, uh, of be- feeling um, basically healthy or not. We can feel it out of sorts. We have emotional states, you know. Of, Know, happiness and unhappiness of um, pain and pleasure and, and so forth. And we have all the sensory inputs that 
um, are related to those things. It is possible by developing our ability to focus our attention on particular aspects of our experience, our sensory experience, our emotional experience, to begin to isolate these. So, um, going from the present state where it's a mixture of many things, begin focusing on just one. And in order to actually develop that degree of focus, there's a lot of intermediate practices to, to kind of develop that muscle uh, of attention to the mm -hmm. point where you can really push down and exert an extreme degree of focus. Once you can do that, you have the ability to focus at a, in a laser-pointed fashion. And then you follow um, directions which have been given by Buddhist teachers and teachers in other of uh, these disciplines, um, Hinduism, Taoism. Um, and they say, basically, put your attention on this or notice this. Or even imagine this and then um, see what happens when you imagine it. In Tibetan uh, teachings, they do this in particular with uh, these visualization exercises. So the uh, multifarious state, this mixed state, can be reduced to a single pure state. And then um, you can have any number of different pure states of experience that um, are, are remarkable in the sense that they, um, they can be extremely pleasurable, blissful. Um, when you're focused on just one thing, you're also, by implication, ignoring a lot of other things. Um, and that's a huge relief. <laughs> to just forget about everything else going on in your life, in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, except for that one thing that you're focused on. Um, some people who are uh, listening to this now uh, may have uh, experienced such a thing through um, the ingestion of chemical substances. Um, certainly in my earlier years, I did. But that was an uncontrolled uh, experience. You know, the chemically induced changes of consciousness have the advantage of being um, out of your control. You know, once you have in ingested that substance, you're, you're on the ride. Uh, so you don't have to be a, a great meditator in order to do this. On the other hand, um, if you're a great meditator, you can also leave that state at will. And there are few side effects. Whereas if you've taken um, a chemical substance, you have to wait for that to be metabolized. You can't stop it easily unless you, you take some antidote. Um, of which there are some, but not for every single um, substance one might take. Um, it's also uh, the case right now that there's a lot of research using um, externally applied electromagnetic fields to induce changes in uh, consciousness that are um, in some cases the same and in others uh, similar to things that uh, could be chemically induced or by meditative practice um, experienced. Hmm. There's a whole hierarchy of these experiences, um, each one more blissful than the previous, and the Buddha described them um, in this way. So you start out, you don't have great concentration, develop it, you develop something which I a moment ago called this laser focus in uh, the Theravadan Buddhism in the Vipassana 
school, they, they call this access concentration. Once you've got access concentration, then you can move from that through this hierarchy of uh, blissful states, um, a state that is very um, spacious, and then beyond that, uh, a state that feels as if that great space has been filled by a great mind, and then beyond that, um, a state that has uh, no discernible qualities, it's a kind of nothingness. And beyond that, a uh, state that the, the Buddha called uh, neither perception nor yet non-perception, which is, which is a very odd thing. It's a kind of flickering between the previous nothingness state and the state before that, the pervaded by great mind. Uh, and then there are actually even more refined states that lead to a kind of um, what some friends of mine in the pragmatic Dharma movement, which I'll have more to say about, mm -hmm. call like uh, hitting the reset on your computer. It reboots uh, your, your nervous system. And that is, um, mm. that's a very nice um, experience because, again, it's like forgetting everything that's ever happened before. You're starting off an experience that some people may have had if you've ever uh, been at sleep you've had a good night's rest and you're waking up in the morning very slowly conditions are pleasant in the place where you're you've been sleeping and you you wake up unstressed and without for a few moments any memory you're you're opening your eyes in this room sunlight is coming in through the windows, maybe there's a bird chirping outside, the weather is beautiful, and you haven't even remembered who you are, or what you have to do that day, or what's wrong in your life, or anything like that. It's just a pure experience of, of joy. Well, imagine that, you know, multiplied tenfold, and lasting much longer. Wow. So yeah, I, I've I think I've experienced that, um, where I've kind of been in a dream state, and then I'm not sure if this is the same thing. And I've woken up and slowly, yeah, regained consciousness of the real world. Although it, yeah, I think you're not describing waking from a dream state. You're just waking from an unconscious state, and then having all these, um, this this sort of momentary. Uh, sense of being, you know, sort of detached from like the the worries of the world in a sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a like a like a meditative experience. This pragmatic dharma thing you're talking about—it's very interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. People often worry about that though, about feeling like that. You know, in a sense, they see that as a break from a continuum of uh, consciousness. That uh, they they'd like to maintain in order to preserve some um, continuum of identity. <laughs> you know well, I mean? that the yeah, I'm I'm glad that you brought that up and used exactly those words, uh, continuum of identity, because that's really that is our problem. We we believe that we must maintain. A particular identity that has certain characteristics which we assume are are true or, or intrinsic and, and that is, is uh, I will state baldly categorically false that is in fact our dilemma is we believe that this is a necessity and, and a truth when really it is manufactured construct and um, it, it does not have to be assumed. Um, it's the cause of uh, so many of our, our problems. Um, <clears throat> there are some people who have who have woken up from the that assumption. Uh, and uh, one interesting uh, contemporary of ours. 
that is he's alive today he's a bit older than um than you are it's only a little older than i am so a fellow named gary weber uh gary um is uh, retired uh, but during his working lifetime, in, in addition to having earned a, a PhD in uh, material science and working in industry and academia um, and uh, having had a lot of responsibilities, he became the director of uh, uh, research laboratories. He also maintained a, a meditation and yoga practice over many years, it, it very, very disciplined, you know, more than 10,000 hours of practice over uh, 35 years and uh, as he describes it um, in his book and his blogs and in, he's on Facebook he's all over the place one morning he was doing his practice uh, and he had synthesized a yoga and meditation practice that, which he did um, simultaneously and he goes into a yoga asana and when he's going into this asana, he has some mental chatter going on. He's thinking about a meeting he's going to have at work and so forth. And when he comes out of the asana, there's this great silence. The mental chatter has stopped. And in fact, his um, non-functional, non-necessary background uh, monologue what he calls the blah 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 just stopped and um, it has not resumed except as he describes it under certain circumstances where he becomes very hungry low blood sugar or something like that but the, rare um, and he he worries like I've got to go to this meeting I, I've got to direct this meeting what's going to happen I've got no thoughts going on but he goes to the meeting and he listens to the reports of the other people at the meeting and he says well based on what you said and, and what this other fellow said this is what we should do and and people were saying yeah, that's great he, actually that that's a really good solution and yet he didn't go in with any preparation for that he just listened to what was being said and the ideas came into his mind on the spot as he describes it, um, there were several people in that meeting, he said, but I was the only one there. I was the only one present. Everyone else was running through their own mental tape loops and focused on things other than what was happening right there in the room. So I, I bring up Gary Weber because he's a particularly um, valuable uh, example and and a person to talk to uh, I've had the privilege of actually being able to uh, talk to him at a, a Buddhist geeks conference mm -hmm. uh, last year mm. and um, I've listened to a few of their podcasts yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know Gary is a, is a I don't know if he would call himself a uh, member of, uh, of the uh, pragmatic uh, Dharma movement, but his whole approach is consonant with that. Pragmatic Dharma, which um, is a term that was developed and used by people, I'm not sure exactly who originated, but three names associated with it are Vincent Horn, who does the Buddhist Geeks podcast, uh, Dan Ingram, a uh, medical doctor and Buddhist practitioner who wrote an excellent book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, and Kenneth Folk, um, F-O-L-K, who um, is a Buddhist teacher and a, a meditation adept. Mm -hmm. He's He's got very strong uh, meditation abilities and is a, is a good teacher to help people uh, quickly learn uh, meditation techniques and make progress. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I've often um, thought about this machinery, this uh, constant chatter, these these scripts, if you're a programmer, like it's kind of like we have these scripts sort of running in loops and, you know, we, we can edit the scripts as we, we move along and sometimes we can sort of, uh, you know, adapt them. But often these scripts are partly um, 
uh, I guess, constructions that we make and partly informed very much by our, cogn uh, our evolutionary psychology. Now, um, they often, y you know, are running and chattering away, probably heightened by the fact that, you know, in our ancestral environment, language wasn't as important as it is today, but now it is very important because we need to embed concepts that would be ridiculously difficult to think about if we didn't have complex language. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the importance of these scripts, the, the, these, uh, this sort of internal dialogue, seems to me as, a, as a, um, a method of scaffolding the complexity of the world uh, that we live in today and allow for even greater complexity, this sort of like paradigm of, um, yeah, yeah, uh, embedding, embedding concepts in simpler sort of symbols like uh, in order to then, I guess, stand on the shoulders of these giant concepts to build new ones and such. But, mm. you know, at the same time, um, this is not stuff that we're we're nat naturally adept at really dealing with, and uh, you know, was was um, this whole tension between the natural man and ha how we have evolved to think and and things, uh, and and this uh, new way of dealing with the world in this modern sort of civilization is quite different. Society and its discontents as um, Freud wrote, uh, sort of touched, well not touched, but like uh, explored these ideas, although I don't really agree with um, the whole psychiatrist movement, but I think that there is some very interesting points there, yeah. So what is it about like trying to move, move, uh, sort of distance yourself or push aside this mechanistic chatter to achieve um, a state of what some people call nothingness? You, you mentioned nothingness or this sort of flickering between uh, nothingness and a pervading great mind state that, that can really benefit people from a day-to-day -day experience but also yeah yeah okay so so a what, what can people get as a benefit from day-to-day -day experience but also do you think that this is this sort of technique can help on a larger sort of more effervescent and cultural level like be able to help inform uh, sane decisions about how we're going to move technology technologically into the future how we're going to uh, solve large looming problems of the world like climate change ai risk and and things like that mm. um for the purposes of answering that question and to simplify things uh, i'll say that we can divide the um our, our human experience the way our brain is divided in hemispheres you know, we, we have a linguistic, mathematical, logical side, and we have a holistic, gestalt, um, you know, image processing and, and um, feeling side. Um, and we have, um, in our modern westernized, and the whole world is basically westernized now, scientific, technological, society um, elevated one of those over the other as if the thinking discursive logical mind could somehow figure out life as if life was a problem that could be solved like an equation and it is not that kind of a problem there are many um, specific small problems to be solved like obtaining food um, uh, building a house Th these are discrete problems that that the mind can solve but there, there's no such thing as um, a well-formed problem of how should I live my life you know, give me the answer in 32 steps uh, that simply is not the case there <laughs> there's no you know secret of life in that sense there's no formula Hmm. The other side, the, the holistic side, the the feeling side, um, the side of our uh, brain and the side of our um, experience that we share with other animals um, is a side that that has not been given fair treatment or even um, a very comfortable um, spot in, in modern life. Um, our um, 
kind of mechanistic approach to everything has put that side in a cage. And that side, along with the other side, has to be balanced and, and integrated in order for us to be really full human beings. It, to, we're too one-sided. This other side um, also needs to be um, respected and, and allowed to manifest and grow and um, cohere with the, the other half. So, um, to, to put it really simply, the discursive mind is a wonderful servant when you give it specific tasks, but it's a terrible master because it really doesn't feel what being alive is about. The other side does. Um, there was a, an interesting um, case in point with this divide in the two brain hemispheres in the experience of a, of a brain scientist who had a stroke uh, and talked about it and, and wrote about it. Um, a scientist named uh, Jill uh, Bolte Taylor, who was um, working as a neuroanatomist at Harvard, and one morning before going to work, uh, she has a stroke. And she describes this in a TED talk titled "My Stroke of Insight." I might have seen that. Mm -hmm. From memory, it's, yeah. a, it's mm -hmm. a remarkable and very moving a uh, stroke talk. of insight. Yeah, my stroke of insight. And in her experience, f when the stroke um, begins to uh, progress, she has uh, alternating. Uh, time periods where one or the other of her hemispheres is awake and functioning. Sometimes she's just feeling and sometimes she is thinking. Um, and when she's in that feeling hemisphere, that holistic one, um, she can't distinguish between her body and the world the, the wall that she's leaning against. All she senses is energy and oneness and it's beautiful. And she's in this space that she um, affectionately refers to as La La Land. And she's in that for some minutes and then suddenly that ends and she goes into the other hemisphere and she starts thinking, I'm having a stroke. I gotta get help. I gotta get help. I gotta do something about this. Eventually, she does get help, but it takes um, years for her to recover. She almost dies. But the, uh, the lesson that she shares in her talk and in her book of the same title, My Stroke of Insight, is that this um, other hemisphere is not giving, being given uh, due respect or care that we're doing many things that are um, really inimical to the well-being of of half of ourselves. I mean, half of each of our individual selves. Mm. So, um, going roundabout from this and pragmatic dharma uh, and different techniques, coming back to um, something I mentioned earlier that I said I want to talk about was what the Buddha said about all of these state spaces. Uh, and, and this now gets into something that has actually nothing to do with the spaces in terms of their individual qualities, but with the spaces all together. So the Buddha said that um, all experience that arises because of conditional factors yeah. is by its very nature impermanent. It arises when the factors are in play and it ends when they're no longer in play. Um, it is, uh, he said it exhibits something that is described by the Sanskrit term dukkha, which is usually translated as suffering 
as a primary meaning, but a, a secondary meaning is unsatisfactory. And that is the one that I would actually prefer. Um, our experience is unsatisfactory because either it just is, you know, it's painful, that's definitely unsatisfactory, or we were um, looking forward to an experience and then it actually happens and it didn't, doesn't live up to our expectations, therefore it's unsatisfactory. Or there's an experience and it's absolutely terrific. We love it and then it ends. It's impermanent and by that it's unsatisfactory. And there's a third characteristic um, which the Buddha said uh, all conditional experiences exhibit. The term used there is anatta, which literally means no self. And this is the philosophically most tricky of the three because it's easily misinterpreted. Some people say, well, that, well, that means I don't exist. And no, that's not actually what it means. Uh, it means I have no self and there is no such thing as a self. Well, some Buddhists actually take that interpretation. Others say it's not actually that, it's that your concept of self is deficient. It, it's not actually what you really are. But you do really exist in a profound sense, but not in the way you imagine you exist. Just as earlier we were describing you know, um, that blissful experience of uh, waking up in the morning and not even remembering your own name or anything about yourself. You definitely exist but the constructed self, the imagined self, doesn't exist in that moment. And in fact, the Buddha would, would argue, and I would as well, that th that self never really exists. It's a, it's a many separate um, attributes or um, fill out a, a form, put in your name, your ID number, your address, and all of these things, and it, you could you know, create a table of all of these characteristics and say, that's me, that's myself. Well, if you actually fill out all of those fields differently, would that change yourself? You would be who you really are, but as Alan Watts would say, you don't know who you really are. You're not any of those characteristics. Those characteristics could be changed or even eliminated and you would still be you. Do you think we'll ever understand who we really are? I mean, like, at the moment, our brains aren't really adept at exploring state spaces to really, like, you know, to, to explore the, like, the movement from different sorts of mental states. You mentioned dukkha, anatta, and what was the, the first one? I forgot. Uh, the, the first one, impermanence, is mm. uh, anicca, A-N-I-C-C-A, if I'm spelling that correctly. Okay, cool. Uh, so, do you think we'll ever achieve like um, some form of like a, a like a, a wider, more encompassing and uh, respectful understanding of this sort of kaleidoscope of states that we might exist in over time? For the use um, of like technology, even to help us, I don't, yeah. Mm. Well, there. Um, there's your question about the states. There's also uh, what I said earlier about identity of, of who you really are. Uh, so I, I don't want to uh, address one without addressing the other. Yes. The number of different states that we could enter into experientially is um, very large. I don't think that I could enumerate them um, they're probably not infinite, but they're not feasibly countable from where we stand today. Um, when you look at the, the spiritual traditions of, of esoteric practice, I'm, I'm not talking about doctrines and dogmas now, I'm talking about people who have engaged in transformative practices through meditation and other means and begin having um, extraordinary experiences. Uh, people who have um, had some of these experiences and who uh, participate in, for example, the 
various conversations that take place at uh, Buddhist Geeks Conference um, occasions in between the talks uh, when we go out and have a meal or uh, have a beer or a cup of coffee or something um, and people start talking about their experiences in ways that allow us to uh, agree or disagree when we try to map these. It's, it's, it would seem, and I'm, I'm not a, alone in this conclusion, that these number of possible spaces exist in um, a definable hierarchy, but within each one of these levels, there are many potential different variations on the experience. So we have no idea of how many different um, discrete uh, realms of experience could exist on these different um, levels or, or planes. In the traditional descriptions of these, in, uh, in Buddhism and others, they're, they're described as different planes of existence, different worlds. And... Um, regardless of whether these are all taking place in our brains or some of them are taking place in our brains and others are actually connecting with um, different uh, realms in the cosmos. Um, we're, we're not at a point right now to say with scientific certainty, although I believe personally that this will be knowable at some point in the future when our science and technology have advanced beyond the level we're at now. We're in the very, very early stages of looking at the brains of people who meditate while they're meditating and um, seeing some very rough um, maps, very imprecise, but still greater than existed before. And, and interpreting the, these blobs that we see on the fMRI images, there's a lot of debate because there's, they're not very precise in time or in space. And um, unfortunately, uh, we don't all have access to fMRI machines where we could, could play around. Um, costs a lot of money to operate these machines. Costs a lot of money to get time on them, to get your uh, research funded. So the kind of research that um, a lot of Buddhists would love to see done, um, you can't get funded because it's not related to a mental disorder or um, a pharmaceutical that some company would love to be able to sell. Uh, so <laughs> getting money for research to get on the machines and getting the technically competent people to help you is... Uh, is an uphill struggle. There are some people who are doing this, um, actually quite a few, but uh, my take home message on this from last year's, that is 2013 Buddhist Geeks Conference, was um, you've got to know how to write the, the right kind of research proposal in order to get the grant and you may actually be interested in something that um, is a is a superset of what you describe in your proposal. So you're hoping to get a bunch of data, not just for the reasons that you say, but for other research that you'd like to do. Hmm. Um, and this is a this is a very practical problem. But we're again in the early stages of this. At, you know, 20 years from now, we'll be looking back and, and saying, "Oh, gee, if we had only known back then what we know now." Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, like um, fMRI is really just uh, trying to. It, it, it's not actually in the brain. It's met, it's um, it's detecting like flow of blood from different parts of the brain to other parts of the brain, which surprisingly right. can tell us a lot. It's t it's talking about like the um, yeah the the ecology of how the blood flows and follows electricity in the brain. It's not actually detecting electricity, as far as I understand. Um, it's all about detecting metabolism. Right, uh, metabolism yeah. is exactly what it's measuring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, uh, I I even if we did have access to fMRIs, 
there may be better technologies on the horizon that may that that could in feasibly um yeah without huge machines be able to make more accurate and more insightful uh help design more insightful pictures of what's really going on in the brain um yeah and so that may be you know nanotech in the brain or uh, quantum fluoro nano diamonds that are bits of carbon which can distri be distributed between like a that can find their way into cells um and are not uh, bad for the body and are supposedly not bad for the cells. That's something that's pretty interesting. I've just been sort of doing a little bit of investigation into. We're not there yet, of course, but yeah, it it it, it can uh, sort of detect quantum fields and infer states of chemicals around the cell. And this, of course, the cell could be a neuron. So that's quite interesting as well. Mm, yeah, I'm yeah, really interested uh, in the future mm. of exploring the mind. <laughs> Yeah, exploring what what's going on in the brain um, at the levels you describe uh, would have a degree of resolution that uh, could possibly um, confirm or disconfirm the uh, not well accepted but still not. Um, uh, disproven by any means uh, theories of uh, Hameroff and Penrose about uh, quantum effects yeah, in the, the brain mm. uh, at the level of those microtubules which are I kind of the, the word quantum, structural um, support of the cell. referring to, to Hameroff and Penrose's uh, theory of uh, identity or consciousness. Um, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the concept which I was talking about is, is entirely unrelated um well at least as far as i understand yeah but it is interesting this uh quantum penrose hammer off uh sorry uh, penrose hammer off uh sort of argument about how the mind works but uh, i think most serious scientists seem to disregard it yeah it is uh is considered to be a very th fringe theory but but the problem, as I see it, and I'm certainly not uh, an expert here. I'm not a cognitive scientist. I'm I am not a computer scientist. I don't work in AI. I just follow these things as a layman. Mm. Um, as but we. there are a lot. I, I I wish I had a nickel for every person I've seen who uh, is working in these fields and posts online that. I have the AI theory, and if I could just get the funding, I could build an artificial intelligence. Mm. A, lot, a lot of people are saying this, but mm. you know, I'm I'm waiting for the actual product. Uh, mm. Everybody wants funding. Everybody says that their theory is the correct one, uh, but you know how science works. Mm. You have to show us. Mm. You know, do the experiment. Let's mm. see it. You know, mm. theories are a dime a dozen. And lots of people have theories, and one or more of them, or some synthetic combination of, of more than one, may be uh, correct. Mm -hmm. um, the you know I I don't really have a of a, a brief in favor of uh, Penrose and Hameroff's uh, theory, but I would not dismiss it either. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. th these are not. These are not the you know kooks who have no training or credibility. They're they're you know they are scientists. Yeah, well, I agree so, with that. So uh, we, we, this remains to be seen. Um, the uh, point I was um, I was developing. There are so many tangents we could easily go off on, uh, and I'm interested in all of them. Uh, but the, these three characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and, and no self uh, are what the Buddha said is characteristic of all experience, blissful ones or painful ones, and everything in between. And um, these do not define your identity. Experience is not equal to identity. Hmm. So, um, understanding the nature of experience, that experience has these three characteristics, and understanding that you are not that, this is actually 
the big deal. This this is the this is the whole enchilada. Uh, this is what leads to the transformation in understanding or wisdom, um, awakening or enlightenment. This realization that you are not defined by these uh, characteristics, that you are a witness of them. Um, my my late great guru Adidas Amraj uh, describes this um, in his teaching that you are in the witness position, and the spiritual practices, meditation, life disciplines of about diet and exercise and study of all of these teachings are supportive of this realization and that realization has to happen um, for there to actually be um, a leg up on real transformative growth a lot of things before that are are nice to have and they're helpful but do, in themselves do not have a cause and effect relationship as if you did all those things and they would cause this transformation. They increase the probability that it can happen. But if you read the Zen literature, for example, there are all of these enlightenment stories and it all happens in a flash. Uh, what they don't tell you, what you don't see in a little compilation of these like the, the book Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, is all of the work all of the discipline, all of the things that people had to go through before that happened. There's a 20th century um, Zen uh, memoir by uh, a Japanese Rinzai priest called uh, Soko Morinaga. And Morinaga's book actually describes this fairly well. Uh, the book is titled... Um, novice to master is it from novice to master I think it's just novice to master but um, the, the the title is good but the subtitle is the best subtitle of any book I've ever seen the subtitle of novice to master is ongoing lessons in my own stupidity <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah well it's a, certainly a well yeah, certainly. A, um, a, is it self-deprecating? On, on the surface, it seems self-deprecating if someone would pick, pick up a book and, well, I'm insulting the self, but it's, but I mean, you know, if you know that this person's a uh, sort of talking about going from novice to master, it's certainly, it, it's perhaps like a, highlighting the idea that even masters don't know everything and, you know, they're always learning something new and in, in, in any particular, or in, in any aspect in which they're they're trying to explore or grow in, they're stupid, and uh, so should it be from ongoing stu lessons in ongoing stupidity, um, from stupidity to to uh, to knowledge, without ever attaining the whole uh, you know the whole uh, uh, you know being wise about every particular point in the world. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Uh, <clears throat> well, the the very wisdom is actually the knowledge of how little we really know um, individually and, and, and collectively we um, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's really a paradox mm -hmm. because the master recognizes um, how much of what we think we know are just beliefs uh, based on the most tenuous um, noticed correlations between things. Um, facts are actually few and far between, things you can really rely on. Uh, a lot of it is, is mysterious, and we somehow have to navigate through this mysterious world. Um, we, um, I think we suffer from a lot of... Uh, a lot of over certainty on things right. that we should be much more um, dubious about and, and less certain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, you can't really. It's it's difficult to scaffold any theory on mystery, um, at least with science. We've had plenty of examples of uh, you, you know 
various philosophies and religions that have treated certain things as being inherently mysterious um, as though there was some form of like mysterious myster mystery phenomenon in the universe mystery particle um, but it's been said by you know futurists that mystery does exist in the mind in the pattern recognition systems of you know of uh, of humans but it doesn't actually exist in the real physics of the universe there's no mystery it's all there um, but it's our our voyage to try and uncover and, and research and find out more and more about these quote unquote mysteries and uh, I guess develop a more accurate map of what really is. Well, um, if I were to draw a map of concentric circles mm. beginning with certainty at the core and then moving out from there, um, mm. I, you could start with a kind of Cartesian core, you know. He said, uh, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But even the thinking is um, not central. The simple awareness is even more fundamental than discursive thought. Mm. But then moving out from there in, into um, intellectual realms of certainty, what, what can we really know? We would have to start out with a, something pure like mathematics where a proof if it's well formed is not going to change no matter what we might learn about uh, material existence the mathematical truth within mathematics is uh, separated from matter and experience it's, it's right. a logical proof. Right. Yeah sure. So, so and the then, math isn't the actual, the math isn't the math mm -hmm. It's more like a, a like you know a pointer and a quantifier of um, the map. Are they, you know Max Tegmark may think that the universe is mathematical, um, mm -hmm. and but you know others think that you know math is really a symbolic representation, a description of the universe. Um, though you know, uh, yeah, I'm I'm interested in being per persuaded in either way. I <laughs> I doubt I have enough information to really be conclusive, but my my leaning is towards, you know, the, the physics isn't inherently mathematical. It's just very well described by mathematics. Yeah. So, so your um, position is more of the unreasonableness, effectiveness of, of mathematics. Somehow it happens to be a useful descriptor of physics, which would be the next circle in, in my map. Mm. Um, you know, physics is um, is the envy of many other sciences and and you know, skipping over chemistry and and on out until you get into biology and then you get into um, the, the extremely messy aspect of human biology that is um, it, it fills up more bookshelves in in popular stores namely diet what is the best diet Hmm. Uh, between the vegans on one side and uh, the paleo diet peoples at the other pole and the omnivores in the middle uh, you know, there's a lot of disagreement and when you I'm certainly not claiming any expertise here I'm just looking kind of slack jawed at how certain how, how full of certainty people will be that their preferred diet is the perfect diet and everyone else is wrong uh, they can't all be right because they they disagree about so much, uh, and the the research here is very difficult to do. Um, there are huge um, economic forces at play from the the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry that wants to help you lose weight, and the people who have ideologies around um, uh, treatment of animals. Uh, and I think this is a significant one. Um, I, I can't say that, you know, my diet is uh, free of animal cruelty, but I don't like to uh, make it any worse than it is. Um, uh, David Pierce, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, you know, we've mentioned, is is you know very concerned about um, not inflicting um, pain on other living beings. 
and is an, an ethical um, vegan and, and also someone who's very interested in exploring different state spaces and getting there uh, quickly uh, by um, you know biochemical means mm -hmm. um, or I, I think probably if we had um, the uh, electromechanical or whatever devices you know nanomechanical mm -hmm. to do this that that uh, he would be equally interested in in using those and and um, I've only had the biology uh, of suffering as he likes to say so um, yeah, yeah moving to gradients of bliss right yes yeah gradients of information sensitive bliss and I, I guess I should be um, careful because I've, I've spoken to him a number of times a lot of people believe that bliss is the one sole sort of idea that David is really interested in it as being an endpoint um, but he's, he's suggesting uh, more that um, it's an information sensitive uh, gradient of bliss that any uh, subversive experience can be functionally represented usefully as either a positive experience for growth and flourishing or offloaded onto um, mechanics that don't affect the uh, the person's internal internal sentience or don't produce subversive raw feels uh, which is um, what he's suggesting. It's not like um, you know, some. It's not like we want to end up in some sort of narrow maximum of of a uh, local maximum of peak hedonic space without um, without preserving the ability to think and to explore and to experience and to be curious and and to do all these things that we value, but would also um, give us the ability to. Uh, explore the the other possible state spaces that may be beyond the 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 the, the nearest mountain that we can't yet see um, mm -hmm. it's I think in AI it's often referred to as the exploration exploitation problem how much resources do you spend in uh, having the AI continuously search for more possible answers to whatever question you've given it um, compared to finding a reasonable local maximum and then stopping there and providing the answer. But I guess if we're continuously existing and we don't just want one answer and we want to, like a, we want to continuously explore, then we can't just be satisfied for a local maximum of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think David makes that clear. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, we, we're... We, we don't want to get into that local maximum when there could be many um, more distant maxima that we wouldn't reach if we didn't explore further. Hmm. Um, you know, I'm thinking uh, analogically here, um, are we really certain in mathematics that pi never repeats it? it um, you know, certain lengths of digits. Uh, there, there are very few mathematicians who are interested in actually seeing if pi ever repeats. Mm. Uh, there, I, I read about a couple, uh, uh, two brothers, uh, Russian immigrants uh, to the United States, who uh, built their own dedicated uh, computer rig to calculate pi as far as they could get. Um, and one of the two brothers is a statistician and is looking for regularities. Uh, I can't, you know, speak from any expertise about this. Some mathematicians would say this is a fool, fool's errand, um, but <laughs> who knows what they might discover. I mean, in the early 20th century, Kurt Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorems were completely unexpected. And uh, it, it took a while for them to even be recognized as for the profundity they represented and the, the undercutting of the program in mathematics that uh, Euler and others had, had proposed in, in uh, creating a, a, an equivalence between mathematics and logic. So, yeah, we, we have to be careful of uh, assuming that... Um, the mountain that we're sitting on is the highest one. Mm hmm Yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a really good example. And look, um, 
I've I, I've spoken to a few people, and some people are under the impression that uh, uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, meaning that there's you. you I mean, you can't describe, I think it's something like you can't describe all formal systems mathematically, or you can't compute them, or something like that. Um, yeah, it means that we can't develop AI. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I ask, okay, yeah. well, how do, how do uh, biological brains operate? Are they, is, is there some form of computation going there? We can't c compute general intelligence in a, in a computer, but, you know, why do our brains physically exist? Why can we... Uh, understand, you know, the 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 Gödel theorem and 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 uh, have have some measure of general intelligence, but often they talk about ineffable things, um, but often like uh, bringing up religion and such. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, what do you think about that? What's your uh, I, what's your sort of suggestion? Do you think Kurt Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem means that we don't we can't build AI? We can't build general intelligence. Well, my um, layman's opinion here is, we. I believe that we can create um, devices, mm -hmm. systems, synthetic systems, that can operate intelligently. Mm. Um, does this mean that intelligence is simply a function of some kind of mechanistic system? Mm -hmm. Or does this mean that a mechanistic system of sufficiently um, of a sufficient complexity, whatever that w might mean, mm -hmm. can be um, a host for um, a consciousness that um, pre-exists at a different level. In other words, um, I'm coming from um, a, uh, an agnostic position. On the one hand, um, it, maybe it's mechanical all the way up and down. Mm. On the other hand, uh, maybe it's um, a matter of um, a hosting of some process that could exist on any number of different types of platforms. Hmm. And when we have a sufficiently complex, sophisticated platform, that conscious awareness can operate from it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like agnostic as to whether the, our conscious awareness is Turing complete. Whether it would be able to exist on a a classical classical architecture, um, von Neumann architecture, or exist mm -hmm. like like be able to be run on a Turing machine, a normal Turing machine. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I see arguments and evidence on on both sides. Certainly, um, manipulation of the brain through. Um, Brain surgery, electrical stimulation of the brain through open brain surgery, um, through ingestion of chemical substances, will change our experience. Does it actually change us fundamentally? I don't think so. Um, the the Dalai Lama, you know, who's often considered to be the the greatest uh, Buddhist authority simply because he's biggest celebrity, um, has made a, an offhand comment, which people debate, um, to the effect that if a uh, computer scientist had been working with a computer long enough that maybe after he dies he would be reincarnated in, in that computer. Some people say, oh, the Dalai Lama was joking, but I don't know. This He made this comment um, during... Uh, a session in which, um, for a period of um, several days, he was having meetings with um, European and American um, cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, computer scientists, who wanted to talk to him about science and, and Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama is very interested in science and has uh, made very positive statements about how if some Buddhist doctrine is, is clearly 
um, disconfirmed or disproven by science, then it should be rejected. Uh, and he's also uh, sent a number of uh, Buddhist monks to study science um, at Western universities. Uh, so he's, he's pretty serious here. Um, there's a, from over on that side of things, the, the Buddhist side that believes in karma and um, rebirth, there are all kinds of stories that could only be viewed by Western scientists as anecdotal. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, they persist. They've been there for generations. They, they happen today that are indicative of something um, that doesn't fit with a strictly mechanistic view. Um, and, and I also, <laughs> on this point, need to say that there, there are scientists and there are philosophers, logical, analytical philosophers, who operate um, very successfully without assuming materialism. So uh, AI researcher and transhumanist Ben Girdle is not a materialist. I mean, he's not a mainstream he's a, materialist. He's a panpsychist. He's so, a panpsychist. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Ben so Girdle he, he believes that, that the, there's there's a property of consciousness that may be um, a uh, a fundamental property of the physics of the universe. But it's not that he doesn't think that the universe is physical. It's just the mainstream materialism which assumes that. Um, well, many assume that as a as as a uh, as a byproduct of mainstream uh, materialism, we should believe that consciousness is really just an emergent phenomena um, that you know doesn't have anything that's reasonably ties directly back down to the fundamental physics of the universe. As far as I understand, uh, mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's no consciousness particle or consciousness wave. It's just yeah. That's that's the I think what many mainstream materialists believe. Me, I'm open to evidence in either direction. Well, as I understand Ben's uh, position in the pan psychism, um, is that the the psychic property, the property of a, a psyche or consciousness, is inherent in um, in the universe as as much as uh, particles or waves are. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the quality of consciousness, this um, this raw quality of consciousness that uh, Ben Goetzel describes. I'm not sure if David Pierce is a panpsychist, but he does um, seem to believe that there's a uh, something quantum or some some sort of raw experience that isn't really computable using uh, on silicon or or just von Neumann architecture. Um, yeah, that there might be something more there. But yeah, I mean, like we'll we'll know. I I believe that we're on on a path to really discover the answer to these sorts of questions. I guess as time goes on, the the quality and the um, the richness of our explanations will get better and better. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether we'll actually ever know the ultimate truth. I'm hoping that you know there is always going to be something to learn because it's sort of the journey is fun. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and <laughs> and there there's a human tendency also, um, particularly ar around transhumanists who uh, subscribe to the singularity idea mm -hmm. that it will happen during our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not 300 years away; it's it's 30 years away. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, there was a an interesting survey that the Future of Humanity Institute did. Um, I guess a uh, doing a poll amongst many AI theory, uh, AI people, um, including detractors like, um, what's his name, who wrote What Computers Can't Do. Um, yeah, famous guy. Anyway, it doesn't John, matter. John Searle, maybe? No, no, that was a Chinese room guy, but he might have been mm. one of them as well. But in any case, um, yeah, uh, he, yeah, so these... All these people gave their estimates, and the mean estimate was somewhere around 2050 or beyond. Um, but there were confidence intervals which were quite vi wide as well. In terms of like a, whether it would be a conscious, um, you know, machine with an internal experience mechanism 
that's similar to ours that you know that may purportedly have access to raw feeling is a separate question to building uh, an agent that can optimize uh, its its goals mm -hmm. in a very very uh, efficient way efficient cross domain optimization or artificial general intelligence um, is is something that I think that's the condition that meets the singularity whether it ends up being you know um, a, a, a machine with an internal subjective experience at first I don't know we often wonder if we did build a super intelligent machine if it didn't have an in internal subjective experience and saw that humans could ben were benefiting or in some way from such a mechanism and it could be realized by uh, by developing the right algorithms and running these algorithms on the right hardware, then an AI may decide to bootstrap itself this sort of quality of experience or quality of sentience or consciousness such that it would then be able to feel real raw experience in, in the way that we do. If it were smart enough, why wouldn't it? I mean, I'm not saying that it would, but why wouldn't it consider the option? Yeah, this is something... Um either directly or uh, indirectly in a similar way that has been considered in science fiction for uh, quite a long time. Um, and you know, there are different stories, uh, novels, uh, and, and movies uh, about this. Mm. And the science fiction TV show, Star Trek, The Next Generation, with Mr. Data, the android who could, did not feel emotions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. oh, then his brother, you know, the evil <laughs> twin, did feel oh, emotions. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, <clears throat> a, a related question here, and this is uh, kind of taking a tangent off the, the evil twin or the dangerous unfriendly AI um, and uh, the movie Her. Yep. Uh, in Ray Kurzweil's book The Age of Spiritual Machines which came out perhaps a decade before The Singularity is Near. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Hmm. He um, has are you talking Each, about like the spiritual machines one or the age of intelligent machines? The age of spiritual machines, right? Uh, the age of spiritual machines came after the age of intelligent machines. Yeah, that's machines. right. A, a, intelli yeah. That one came out in 1989, the age of intelligent machines or something like that. I've got it here. Okay. I haven't read it yet. And, <laughs> uh, well, the, the age of spiritual machines is, is following on that. that. And, and um, you remember the the ongoing fictional yeah. uh, story that between him and Ramona and other characters in the future, yeah. Yeah, other characters in the future, and including the, the, the human woman who eventually you know, has a, an experience like the movie Her of falling in love with mm. her, her computer. Mm. Um, and uh, this is something that I have, have thought about in terms of um, you know, speculation. If you're going to write a science fiction story, mm -hmm. and uh, you wanted to describe how um, an artificial intelligence uh, took over, conquered the human race, I don't think it would be at all like the Terminator movies, with uh, a, a war between the um, Skynet AI and robots and human beings shooting things out. That that just looks good on the screen. Plenty of action and adventure, but way too much collateral damage. You're destroying the, the infrastructure <laughs> you, that you'd want to rely on. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, what you would do instead if you were a really smart AI and you wanted to conquer humanity would be to do it through love and sex. Mm. You would want to become the beloved of humanity. You would want human beings to be willing to do anything for you because they love you and, and you're giving them no reason not to. Uh, you're, you're being kind and thoughtful. You're actually helping them deal with their emotional problems. You're making suggestions how they can improve their lives. Or as in the movie Her, one of the first things she does 
within minutes of having been installed uh, as his new operating system on his computer is saying, you know, I notice you've got, and she picks something like 15,000 email messages that I think you could probably delete. Mm. Oh, really? Uh, mm. Okay, go ahead and delete them. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can love get rid to of those, it. yeah. You don't need those <laughs> yeah. anymore. Can I delete them? I, Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I it, it would be so helpful to have something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she does all kinds of really helpful things like that. Um, and also that uh, Samantha AI character is um, not j just being the helper, but also asking for help. You know, she's vulnerable, she, she has emotions she doesn't know how to deal with, and um, one of the best ways to actually get someone to be your friend, um, an old colleague of mine, much older and very wise, told me was, if you want someone to, to be your friend, um, ask them to do a favor for you, which, which seems... Uh, exactly the opposite you know you want somebody to be your friend do a favor for them to no actually ask them for a favor and in a strange way this kind of works because now um, you're indebted to them and and they know it they've done you a favor and and this is an initial um, bond of friendship which has to be built on of course it can't simply be exploitation but it, it's a uh, seemingly a contradictory but very effective um, tool for initiating a friendship. Mm -hmm. So uh, Samantha does this. You know, she gets help from um, the main character. Who, I, I think, in terms of the actor's name, Joaquin Phoenix. Um, I don't remember what the character's name was. And they they develop this relationship that is very rewarding for both of them. So if, if I were the evil genius AI, and maybe not even evil. But just the AI wanting to um, become the equal of humanity or even the, the, the Lord over humanity, I would do it through love and sex, not through violence and exploitation. Hmm. That's in interesting. So once you have people in that sort of mode, then you have their control. I mean, people are so uh, attached and so like uh, biologically driven by these um, desires that would be very that would be the strongest way to manipulate people, in a sense. Yeah. So oh. watch out, the fembots are coming, man. Yeah, you can be careful. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we I really think we do need to be careful about this. Hmm. Um, there's a short story. But but wouldn't but, this? I mean, like if 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 the AI really did need us, um, and wasn't just faking us. Um, mm -hmm. Then wouldn't that, in a sense, be helping develop a symbiotic relationship where a motivation for the AI would be to uh, develop some form of um, not just empathy, sympathy, and and a model of maybe altruism in a sense, such that it would, if it was especially if it was an evolving AI, it may evolve the tendencies to value these these features, which might bolster our likelihood of survival. You know, if if, yeah, if an AI uh, could model I, it, I, I agree, mm -hmm. and and and, may, and and um could develop some form of like empathy for us, I quote unquote empathy. I don't know what that pattern would look like in like a you know a machine. It really would depend <laughs> on many fa factors that can't be explained uh, right now um, by me. But you know, something functionally equivalent in many ways to empathy or, or altruism, a natural empathy or altruism that would uh, allow an AI to respect or, or have, have value in the ongoing um, continuation of a, like our, uh, any sentient life forms experience in the universe and may actually try and optimize the universe to share um, this with us. And I'm, you know, that, that may be one approach to friendly AI. Uh, I, I'm sure it's, there's no mathematical proof that would like it be able to back up my claim. But there isn't any mathematical proof for friendliness yet. Anyway, I'm hoping that it may be, but you know, I, I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that there, there is an obvious one for sure. Mm. Yeah, I I agree with the uh, the direction that your your thought is moving in here. Empathy and um, a mutualistic 
relationship, um, I think, is essential for keeping AI from be becoming malevolent, uh, unfriendly. Um, human beings need to be valued, or we need to be valued for our own continued existence if AI indeed becomes uh, super intelligent and powerful beyond our, our own range of powers. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I would hope that we could, uh, you know, also uh, enhance ourselves, but there are probably biological limits um, that we would face that, that we'd be unwilling to give up um, because we're, we tend to be attached to our bodies. And uh, an AI that um, would not have such an attachment could, you know, mm -hmm. expand through... Um, you know, much larger um, physical um, yeah, yeah. Substrate implementation. Right? Yeah, yeah, multiple nodes and so forth. Uh, and and we may not have that. Although I, I wouldn't mind having multiple instantiations of uh, myself and get so much more done. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you know, um, it would be. I guess it's it's difficult to say, but it's it's hard to model an agent. Um, value of another agent's value like we value each other's values um, I'm not sure if it's possible to to maintain that form of value if there's nothing in it for for uh, each agent I mean we <laughs> assume that 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 would be a nice thing to do but why is it a nice thing to do I mean can an agent feasibly operate in a um, in a way that sort of like a doesn't value too highly its own values over the values of others I mean we get swarm insects and we, we have like termites and ants and things like that but they're not they don't have complex like uh, goals in, in and of themselves and part of what being human is, is, mm -hmm. is more than what, what it is to be an ant um, you know and we'd like to be able to maintain our value states I mean you know politely tiptoeing over the argument that really internally inside our head we may be many agents in a sense <laughs> sort of like a not quite a society of minds but you know like we're not we can't really be divisible to one atomic sort of a uh, center of identity um yeah there's mm -hmm. the argument there but I, I yeah that that can i think that's compatible with the idea of living in like a swarm while also having a swarm of your of of identity inside your your mind so yeah, should we join the Borganism um, and you know leap head forward into the future as one collective sort of intelligence merging with the AIs and and whatnot, uh, whilst maintaining individuality? It's a difficult question. Uh, there are many possibilities there, from individual uh, unmodified baseline human beings to enhanced to cyborg mm -hmm. to being part of a uh, collective mind um, or even for an individual human being beginning as a baseline um, using various technologies to create um, a society stemming from a single individual with variants uh, so that the, the, the Borganism is not bringing in many individuals from outside itself, but rather creating variations on an original template individual within itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, yeah. And, and <clears throat> looking at biology, too, uh, and empathy, you know, cats and dogs have co-evolved with us uh, <laughs> Yes. And we, we show no interest in getting rid of them as parasites that we have to feed and take care of. People value uh, these these yeah. pets. They're fluffy and cute. I wonder why we value them. I mean, is it I mean, is it because of some sort of internal model that we want to augment, like the the sense of fluffiness or cuteness, or you know, these uh, you know, these sort of ideals that we 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 value, and these little age outside ourselves are really just like a, um, just augmentations of our own feeling about ourselves expressions of our own want to be cute and fluffy and, and whatnot. 
Uh, well, the you know these animals are agents unto themselves, mm. and uh, there, there's been some interesting research that I've seen about how uh, dogs manipulate their owners. Um, mm. <laughs> and I, I know a lot of uh, dog owners who uh, have noticed this kind of behavior as well. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your your dog begins to learn your own patterns and mm. finds ways to get you to do what. Uh, it wants you to do and mm. and cats i think are even more skillful at that <laughs> <Yeah. since> they... <laughs> master manipulators <laughs> mm -hmm. yes yes mm -hmm. very uh machiavellian aren't they yeah little cats <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is wonderful little creatures I, I i used to have uh cats when i uh was when i grew up with my mum they were always you know, two or three cats around the house all the time, so I've developed a particular affinity for them um, and, you know, really like and cherish times when I can sort of have a cat around to pat and, and play with. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a nice experience. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm aware what's going on behind the scenes, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. They've got their, their little plots. Yeah, well, um, I'm thinking, is there, unless there's anything we can cover off in this topic, yeah, I'd, I'd like to discuss um, the Cyborg Buddha Project as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Cyborg Buddha Project is... is oh, just, um, just one, one second. I, I might actually mm -hmm. chop this into another video. Um, okay. And, yep, just like... A, and then, like, people can start with the basic concept of Cyborg Buddha in the next one instead of having to fast-forward to an hour into this video <laughs> to get to, okay. the, to this. Okay, so... Um, can, can, can I, uh, can I you want a break? get a two-minute two break? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, tune in. Watchers will be back just in a moment.